Assalamu alaikum, my Instagram Cuba Utor family. Uh, good to see you at this. By the way, it's a really special um, chat today because we have hit 40 live chats. I started this not that long ago. Um, hi Goldie, um, and I didn't really think that it would become this serious or this content driven or that I would really get this much engagement and interest from not only people who've been with me on trips, but people who've been curious about these edu tours that we've been doing, who've been curious about the work that we do at architectural heritage sites all across Pakistan. Um, there's an incredibly warm and supportive expat community from all over the world who joins us regularly. I get DMs, uh, we get comments, and now there's a new family that's joined us, which is all the network who have either known Jean or who have studied with her or worked with her presently or they've been peers and colleagues. So the whole uh, bandwidth, the network of the Cube Editor family has doubled. Um, the fact that we're at 40 chats and we're continuing and the content is continuing and I'd like to think it's not boring and dull material even now. Um, a lot of it is thanks to you, thanks to your support. So let's keep at it. Let's turn this into a course. Let's turn this into proper curriculum. Let's do this together. We want your participation. We want your contribution. I'm open to ideas, suggestions, critiques, um, all of it. So we've been doing this all together. Please don't sit back and wait for myself or Jean to find solutions or suggestions um, to what we want to do in the future. This is an open platform. That's the beauty of it, that it's not closed. It's not a members only environment. Please bring in friends and family, share the Instagram live chats, uh, recordings on IGTV, and let's spread the word. Let's get more people into the fold, get more people into the family. Um, I would really want everyone to not only just comment, but also participate, contribute, share content, give me places to go look at, give places to go research that I don't already know about. Um, let's do this together. So on that note, thank you very much for making us, uh, bringing us here to 40 really successful uh, Cube Editor live chats and on that note, I'm going to bring Jean on who is here Always here as you know <clears throat> Ahmad lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us Jean Yes, here I am Hello. <laughs> Never quite ready. I'm really I apologize oh, All right, just a second here the sun changes everything. Oops. All right. There we are. Okay. I'm Table, here. not sh not shaking. No. Nothing will fall. You no. won't check the phone, it won't fall off its stand. And also the the tropical storm yes. coming is a herald of the impact that we're gonna have. I heard your introduction. So my phone will not stand up when that hits, that's for sure. Okay, I'm here, everybody. Hello, hello. So I think we need two helmets. One helmet for you, ah. anti-hurricane anti helmet for you, and an anti-hurricane helmet for the phone. Okay. I think both of <laughs> you yeah. guys yeah. are going to need helmets because this se series cannot <laughs> be stopped by any storm, by any hurricane by any climate change activity, we must continue. Keep forging on. Don't speak to me. Speak to the <laughs> stars. Disaster. Out of alignment with the stars. We'll find out if this region <laughs> is, uh, is not going to be upset. So it's tomorrow morning. I have a week to recover. Tomorrow morning. Yeah, tomorrow morning through the day and as somebody I know said, whose name may be Zane, Zan, Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> they, they, <coughs> these weather events, these climate uh, disruptions are unpredictable. So we'll see. We'll see. They are unpredictable. And that is, therein lies their magnificence and their majesty. If they were predictable, then <laughs> they, would be, they would be human. But thankfully, yeah. they're not human, <laughs> and they're not predictable, Perfect. and therefore we can enjoy in their yeah. incredible, incredible power as they mock us for believing we know more than we actually do. I that love that. Is exactly it. <laughs> it's it's 
I mean, there are there were some amazing pictures when the Sandy Hurricane hit <clears throat> the Rockaways, which are the barrier islands in the New York Bay, protecting the mainland. And a lot of people have settled in there, the Rockaways. And there were amazing photographs of the waves just knocking the doors off <clears throat> the houses and going right into people's houses. And it made me really feel you haven't paid any attention to us. All these incredible things that we depend on life for. You haven't paid any attention to us. We're coming into your house. We're going to grab you and take you with us. I mean, it was so powerful right before the first climate march in New York City. I think Sandy was mm, maybe 10 or 14 years ago. The date isn't as important as the impact of it and how it supposedly woke us up. So we'll see, because the storm is headed for New York City as well. And maybe to Karachi. Karachi. So K Karachi is expecting another uh, set of rains from the 7th. So later on this week, our monsoons are not over yet. So we're expecting some more flooding and some more broken trees and <laughs> falling buildings. Uh, we're expecting more storm drains to be flooded and overspilled. So we have this performance art like manholes with fountains, black sewage <laughs> fountains all across the city. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's a film waiting to be made. And the funny thing is that all those people on here who've been following the Pakistan news today will know that the army has been brought to help clean the city. How sad is that, that the, all the different municipalities of Karachi and the province government have had to be pushed aside and we've had the army come in to help clean out the stormwater drains that oh. over 20 years have been filled with black, black, uh, black and blue plastic bags and other garbage and oh so the city, city floods on its, in its own sewage. It's, um, it's a really a bittersweet symphony in so many ways. But is that army competent? Are they going to be able to yes. really get? Yes. yes. Well, yes. that is such a good sign. The man who leads the continent, the lower part of the North American quote unquote continent, he sends in the armed forces to subdue the protesters, not to help the infrastructure. <clears throat> so in some ways, what you're saying may be hopefully turning. Karachi has finally come to the attention of the national government and they're going to start cleaning up the show. I think so. I think so. And there is definitely a sense of excitement in the public because there's mm -hmm. also uh, a story that's recently been released that they're going to try and turn it into a federal territory so they can control it from the very top. And it really, it, it makes sense because Karachi is the heartbeat and the economic heartbeat and the financial uh, engine for the country. So for it to be controlled and looked after and nurtured by custodians sitting at the very top as a federal territory uh, would, would make me very happy. And I mean, the poor city is, is like an orphan child and really sort of running around with, with dirty nails and, you know, no, uh, snot coming out of its nose and its clothes are dirty. And, you know, it's got, it, its hair hasn't been washed longer than mine. So it's, it's a messy child and it needs discipline. It's, you know, it's taking drugs, bad quality drugs on the street and it's sort of almost on the verge of like really low end prostitution. So this child needs help. Well, obviously an image came in my mind for you to draw, you know, with Karachi over the top, but it's a human <laughs> with all of these because it's, it's affecting all the humans too. I Absolutely. can't. I cannot Absolutely. see how anybody, given the, the photos you sent me, given the description you just gave, I mean, everybody in varying degrees is suffering in just the way you said. It's not, Every, not, ev everything is suffering. Yeah. It doesn't matter how well to do you are and how many uh, phone contacts you have with important people, everybody's suffering. And until last week, till, uh, I mean, there was a very serious conversation happening among some uh, very engaged 
citizens of the city to actually get together and put together a group, a committee, and try and figure out what we can do to actually participate in city administration. And I think that if this army uh, idea had not come out, then this group of people would have really got together and started working on a plan, which, which is nice to know that, you know, when push comes to shove, uh, the citizens of Karachi do love their city enough to get up and say, we will take care of it because you can't. So I think that they've really just been fed up by the whole situation we're going to take over. So that it's really nice to know. But I mean, <clears throat> who knows what will really happen? We'll see. Well, if storms are unpredictable <coughs> and humans think they control, then we have to wait and see. There's no way, uh, no possible way. We'll wait and see and we wait in the wings. Um, it's like Shakespeare's King Lear about to roll itself out and you're just waiting in the background to bring in the nice guys. So that's kind of what we have to do. And I'm not a big fan of Shakespeare, which is why I keep referring to him. In yeah. fact, I don't like any of his work at all. Well, I know you don't. So it's, it's like um, the power of your education. I know. Those references come up. And Pavlovian. They've, they've turned us all into well-bred dogs. We're, it's Pavlovian. It's, it's all about being dogs. How good a dog can you be to your Western education? That's what it's all about. Well, for those of you who didn't hear any of our first chats, one of the things that we did talk about that joins almost every place on the earth right now is that our public education systems are grounded in colonial ideals of just how much we should think we have anything to say about our lives, the places we live, what happens to us. It's no different. The United States is no different. And unfortunately, the spread of the educational system of the United States has made everywhere think that this is the way forward. But not when you have ancient wisdom embroidered into yes. Fabrics. What do you have on that's ancient? So I have, you can, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I've got something on that has been embroidered fairly heavily. Uh huh. And yes. I yes. dug it out because what I wanted to wear wasn't available. It was in the wash. But if, I don't know if you can see this or others can see this, but this is a very typical unisex uh, malmal. Malmal was a it was a fabric, very, very fine cotton that was hand woven back before the Mughals, uh, during the time of the Mughals, before the Brits arrived. And it was used by both men and women. Uh, Queen Nur Jahan was known to wear this in white in seven layers before ah. it thin and opaque enough for her to come out. So the ah. fabric I'm wearing is just one layer and it's completely opaque, but it's very, very soft. It's very comfortable. And the embroidery that's done on it. Um, is, is also very typical for men. It's done this way around the placket. It's on the shoulders. But what's different about this one is like the Chinese designer that we looked at yesterday, Wape. Wape had in her Himalayan collection, she had sleeves that went all the way down to the floor. And this is what she had done, Jean. So all of this embroidery, you see how the threads are hanging out. It, it makes this kurta look like it's hairy and the embroidery is not very clear because actually it's inside out. The real embroidery is on the inside. So I had it done inside out and stitched inside out because this ah. part, the construction part of it is what I was fascinated by. And this kurta was made in uh, 1999. So if you can see the texture, it has its own texture, but it's also got all this hair hanging, which is, <laughs> the, which is the, so I, I guess, you know, I'm not particularly hairy, so the kurta makes up for it for me. Um, so it's, uh, I, it's, sort of, it's really nice. It makes me feel sort of really masculine. And I have like, suddenly I have a hairy torso, which I don't have. And I can take it off and send my hairy torso for a wash. So it's, oh, it's embroidered, but all the embroidery is left inside out. So we get to see how it's done and what the marks of the craftsmen were. That shows on the outside. And I know we've talked about it. Um, and you mentioned it the other day. So I thought we, it'd be worth you know, sharing that with everyone else <clears throat> is there's, there's a symbolism in embroideries that are done for clothes, for uh, rugs, for tapestries, whether it's the 
a Native American or it's the Tibetan or the Mayan or ours here um, in the Kalash or even more recent, like the ones I was talking about, the 15th, 16th century embroideries from the Mughals. What, um, what, and you know, we've been talking about sound, Gene. So this has no sound in it, but they do have an expression and a communication. What value do you think that has to us today? I think everybody listening knows that that's a leading question. Yes. <laughs> I he, just for everyone to know, I have no idea what we're going to talk about until I wake up on Monday morning. <laughs> so it's like all of a sudden I'm supposed to become the an expert. Yes, an expert. So I just want to make that very clear at the beginning because I see people listening who know a lot more about embroidery than I do. And the, so that's like, what do you call it? a disclaimer? Disclaimer. If, yes. If anyone hears anything <laughs> that opens for you a whole waterfall of understanding, please put it up when Zen the Summit. video. Yes, or now, but also <laughs> later. Because yeah. the my, um, what draws me, da-da, da-da, oh. da-da, and also, da-da. Yes, <laughs> I, yes. I, you know, and again, everything that I really want is in New York City, and I'm, um, I'm not there. As you know, I make this excuse also all the time. So this is a very modern, just like, Zen was describing with his shirt. It comes from India. And the reverse side of it, it's got all this embroidery. And the reverse side of it indicates to me that it's embroidery, but it's been done with a machine. But this one, which is from Guatemala, inside wow. are all the strings. Yeah, these, and, the hair. Yes, the hair. And by the way, I don't need any hair on my chest. So I am not wearing this inside out. I'm sorry. But so that, that's cheating. So you keep the hair all to yourself. I yes. don't share the hair. It's yes. great. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. So here it is. It's, not, it's yeah. not, nothing like the designer you were talking about, the Chinese designer. <coughs> but Swap what it. interests me among all the threads that are sparked by the idea of talking about the wisdom of ancient, I was gonna say ancient spiders, because it is the spider that yeah. is the center of this. And when you feel these loose threads against your skin, so we did have a conversation about <laughs> second skin. Now, now, comes, we're back to it. Yes, it comes back to it. So, the difference between what it feels like, even though this has embroidery and it's absolutely beautiful, made in India, in in a place where embroidery and weaving and handcrafts are still very, very important. And one of the people, one of the young women, listening. Her mother-in-law in India is one of these master crafts people. So it, it's, it's both something that I have access to, but it's also appropriating this very important hand craft. And then what it does when it's right next to your skin. So I want you at some point to turn your shirt inside and feel all the hair inside against your skin. The, um, the idea of a second skin, especially if it has all these loose threads, which are gonna be stimulating your skin all the time, moving, any kind of movement, those threads are gonna be moving. They're gonna be um, communicating with your cells of your body. And there's a wonderful, 
book by a leading fashion. Uh, she's a fashion designer, but she's also thinking very, um, very focused on how to get the fashion industry out of synthetic fibers, out of machines, out of mass produced fast fashion, fashion. Fletcher, Kathy Fletcher. So she argues in this wonderful little book called Wild Dress, that if then, if you will turn your shirt, not now, we don't want, we don't want, no, no, yes. This, that will really get a lot of viewers, but not, not today, not today. The wrong kinds of viewers. Yes, yes, good. Okay, so she argues that the importance of natural fibers, fibers from where the fibers will be woven, where the embroidery will be made, where the dyes come from, what's called officially fiber sheds in relationship to watersheds. So they're biological regions. And she argues that, that wearing those clothes next to your skin, those fibers, those embroideries, will amplify what she calls the wild in you. Now, she's not, we all call wild, and wild is lawlessness. And we're all finding out that describing as wild and lawless and untamed everything that's not under the grip of humanity has got us into this mess. So what she's talking about is the wildness is you, the understanding that you are nature. So this having this on against your skin, this one I have to get repaired. That's why I don't have it on because it's, um, it's already got lots of repairs, but the weight of it is pulling on the fibers. But wearing that will uh, have an effect below concepts and analysis and into what you feel when you're wearing it. And when I read her talking about this and she had on a shirt that was her grandfather's, I looked down and I was wrapped up in this wool blanket, real wool that I have dragged around since I went camping in Montana, in Colorado, in Arizona. So here I was with these fibers that had in them all these experiences that were in, quote, the wild. So I sometimes wonder why I have this orientation. But if I start looking around me, I see that it's, you know, all these baskets are woven. I see why I have it. So I know uh, we never, and I don't think we ever should reach an agreement on what we mean, mean by second skin that we didn't the last time, but I'm just offering that. So I remember one other conversation that you and I had offline about what we make our children wear, right? Uh -huh. So in terms of ancient wisdom, um, starting off with the skin of the buildings and the um, architectural heritage sites. And we talked about their skins being animated and the materials that are used there. We've talked about how that skin can actually reveal memories that the building is holding and waiting for somebody to ask. So the first question that you ask the building is to its skin, to its surface. Um, I'm not sure what's happening to the lights here, and I wonder if it's the if it's the candle that's doing it. Oh Seems yes, it has been flickering. It has been flickering. Yeah, so I just that yeah, because the camera is not happy with the candle in the background, so we'll get to it. It's a local scented, locally manufactured <laughs> organic candle from Motia. So what you know, as we as we as so I'm listening to you, remind me of the second skin conversation and how we've talked about the architecture building and its skin. I think children 
who are raised wearing organic fabrics and embroidery on the fabric, in the fabric, done by hand, by their grandparents, by other members of the family, maybe their own, their own mothers. I think those, those children will probably, it's still complaining, those children will probably grow up to have a more aware and sensitive connection to the earth and the environment around them without it ever being structured or formalized because they will be wearing this and they'll be absorbing the energy from the grandparent, from their movement, the energy of their hands, from the organic thread, silk thread that they may have selected to make the uh, embroideries, even the design selected, whether it's floral, it's geometric, it's traditional, not traditional. So I think that those, those children, uh, it'd be, it'd be, it would be a really interesting exercise to actually find out if there are adults like you or me who have been, who wore clothes made by their, by the sort of elders in the family, or they wore clothes that were sent down. So mm -hmm. their, their, their baby clothes were their elder brothers, were their father, were his elder brothers, his grandfathers. So there's all that ancestral energy that comes through these clothes. And that is bound to affect that child as it grows up through the osmosis of the energy over the years through its skin. And I think that as I look at adults who have, who were once children that wore brand, branded clothes and clothes that were mixed fibers, that were polyesters, um, that was many times shiny, glossy, plasticky fabrics in this kind of tropical weather. As they grow up, they have a numbness huh. to the world around them because they've constantly wore, worn something that's overproduced and um, mechanical and machine made. Huh. So their, their relationship to the earth around them is very different. If we look at children in the rural areas, who will wear something that is a hand-me-down or it is made of cottons and it's natural dyes. Uh, the colors and the threads would have been you made from local, local uh, flora, local vegetables. And of course the children run around up to their puberty um, as close to naked as possible. So their relationship to the earth and the dirt and the impact of the colors, the natural dyes, the natural fabrics, the embroideries done by the mothers, done by the sisters, they have a very different relationship to the earth. And, you know, they can feel climate change. They can feel the thunderstorm coming. They can feel a change in the earth for the land that they're tilling and farming. I think there's, there's a con very direct connection we can make between, uh, between, the, between the ancient wisdom of the embroidery worn by children and um, a deciphering of the skin embroidery in a sense of the architectural heritage sites. I don't think it's such an extreme stretch of the imagination. No, nor do I. And again, while you were talking, your hands were very much part of how you were explaining what your words were saying, just like mine are now. And right. we, have, we haven't rehearsed this. And what we're talking about, whether we're talking about the fabrics we just described, the, now I went out. Something really strange. Yeah. Something very strange is happening. Can you see me? No, you're looking like a beautiful uh, textile. Pink yes, I know, purple, exactly. A pink and purple, like <laughs> the zigzags that you get in India. It's called, uh, not batik, uh, it's a K word. If anybody on here can see this, Sana, you're here. What what is this? Uh, it's it's um, what's that zigzag? Wow. You've gone pink and purple and navy blue. Yeah, and it. You were the one that was the light was flashing, and now I'm not. I'm gonna get off and get on again. Okay. Okay. Yeah, nothing, try that. Nothing's happening. Okay. Ikat, ikat. That's it. Ikat. It looks like Gina's turned into ikat. Uh -huh. yes. Oh, yeah, that's from the woman I mentioned from India. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Here I go. Let me see if I can get back on. All right. Well, yep. Now we've lost Jean. 
So let's see what happens in a minute or so. Gene Gardner is back. Let's try this once again. Interesting that I think the weather is doing some funny things in preparation for that hurricane. That there is we so weird because the colors oh. were like the colors in here, but in a different pattern. I, I mean, I think somebody's listening <laughs> that is wanting to be heard. So what I wanted to say was how important the hand is, yes, in the connection that we're talking about. So you brought up the skin of the buildings and I'm talking about my skin, but then also what's next to them. So the hand, which a mentor of mine, a colleague, someone I've had a, an opportunity to do um, demonstrations with, Frank Wilson, a neurologist, he's wrote a book called The Hand, How It Shapes the Brain, Language, and Culture. So to me, that's exactly what we're talking about over all of these chats and yes. what we're concerned about in general is the lack of connection between our bodies and our cultures and because culture itself is a word that indicates cultivating the soil that our cultures are cut off and just the way that you explained a child who's running around in synthetic clothes, it's not his fault or her fault. And it's not necessarily the parents either. The onslaught of brand advertising for the things that you were just mentioning, so that clothes seal a person off. No wonder no one understands how the hand and what it makes. Language is one of the things it makes. And well, the brain and then language and then um, culture. But what Frank Wilson spends a lot of time arguing about is how the hands know more. And it shapes the brain in relationship to its experience, our hands. My hands are it, I don't know, they're me. So that really has um, made such a difference in my life. Because then when you start watching your hands, they know all sorts of things that I couldn't possibly explain to you. You know, if I wanted to, um, I mean, I, I don't think I would need to, but if I wanted to show you how to climb a tree, I wouldn't explain it in words. I would climb a tree. You know what I mean? In other words, the hand knows so many things, but we've forgotten that. And because of that, we think all language refers to everything that we know. And one of the interesting um, meanings of the spider in India is Maya. And Maya, it does have ma in it, and people might think immediately of mother, which is one association, but not the ultimate one. It does refer to formlessness. And Maya refers to the illusion that what is physical and right in front of us, in other words, what, you know, like my computer or communicating with you on the phone, that that's reality, that's an illusion. So the spider symbolizes that. And what, where, how does the spider make the threads that she weaves her webs from? Not electricity, not, you know, materials, most computers made someplace in the world where you are with great exploitation of labor, but coming right out of the body of the spider. And I find that just magical that Maya 
and you know reality and the connection beyond the physical world comes out of our body and i started this riff talking about our hands and our hands if they know more than we do if their knowledge is before language then how we shape our brain is tremendously important and it's how we what we do with our hands so if i spend all day typing and this is my excuse for not knowing how to type <laughs> i walked out of <laughs> typing class so insulted this is my future and then Every male assistant that I had when the computers were new, typing away, and I was going like this, and I'm still misspelling every word. I have, you know, absolutely no coordination between my hands and the keyboard. My point being, do we want our brains shaped by machines? That's what's happening. So the spider, how can we return to realizing that what we're, our hands are doing is feeding not just the materials that go next to our skin and then what we feel in relationship to the place this materials came from and the embroidery. And by the way, the embroidery traditionally is very, uh, very much a communication. And people don't change it just to have something new. In fact, there's a, a festival, I think it's in India, where the women get up at dawn and make a fabric and embroidery in one day, and then it is gone. And that's to deal with disaster. So of course, we're facing disaster. And we don't get ourselves in a rhythm like this. The spider herself, when she destroys her web, she eats the silk for the protein, because it takes protein in her body to make it. I mean, what an incredible symbol of the whole, what we were talking about recently, I don't know when or where, about nightshade and fertilizing the soils with the hoop, I don't know, of, of, you know, the right word for a live uh, cast, live chat. But anyway, goes right back into the soil because when we eat what comes out of the soil, we're taking the nutrients. So the spider making her web, it's made from a liquid protein, wants it back. So the other thing that makes us, made me, made you, however you decide to talk about the topic we'll talk about, is fighters and the phenomenal teacher they are. If you turn, they have eight legs, and most of them, not all of them, have eight eyes. If you get a close up, woo -hoo! You know, it's just beyond belief. So if you turn a figure eight on its side, which I just did, it's an infinity symbol. Mm. And one of the things that always fascinates me is the weavings that leave an opening. They're not closed systems. It looks like a defect, but it's really an opening for the spirit of the person who made it, who's joined through movements and gestures and hands and threads and time into the fabric, leaving. So, again, people listening who know more than I do, if you see the video, you can still comment. My understanding of of infinity it is that it has no end, like pi. So that's an open system. Modernity has a closed system, a closed system. And my understanding of the history of mathematics is that from your part of the world, the open system 
when it hit the marketplace, making its way on the trade route to what we call Europe, and then obviously on to the North American continent, it wasn't a viable system in the marketplace. You had to have, you know, this cost 99 cents, not 99.6 you know, 0.678, you know, on and on like pie. So they closed the system. Mm -hmm. And they closed the musical system also. So there's this moment when what we made, what we heard, was what we might call open source now. But it's not quite the same, but it's certainly a beginning. So that fascinates me. Whoops. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So that's, that's the connection between a not very loved animal and my earrings are always spiders. And this always gets people to look twice. Because they're like, what? Because spiders <laughs> are so maligned. I mean, we eat. Why don't, you know, they catch their food. We eat what we pull from the earth. People who eat meat kill. What's, what's the big deal? The spider is part of that same dynamic. So hands, spiders, what we're wearing, what we eat. So interesting, the, you know, the spider is so misunderstood and and underrepresented. Um, every winter, there's a, I'm convinced of the same family of spiders that shows up in my garden. And it's a, it's a large, a very colorful spider that weaves her web and I watch her every day. And it's so interesting because the first day she, she sees me, she stops her work. And she, I'm convinced she knows the wow. human tendency is to destroy. Uh. So she gets cautious. And then the next day I'll show up and I'll come a little bit closer and then she'll stop. So as I get closer to her, she stops. But over time you realize that her proximity with me is becoming uh, smaller and smaller as she develops trust and realizes that he's wow. just an idiot watching. He's not going to destroy me. So she will continue her work until I come to a certain point. And then she says, okay, now step away. <laughs> uh, she never runs away. She never runs away, she does, but she watches me. And eventually she will allow me to come close enough to take a photo, which is literally, I, I mean, last year, I think I was literally only two inches away from her. And I thought she would have run away. I didn't want her to get scared. So it took me a week or so of just getting to know her. And she's a beautiful yellow spider with long spindly legs and black and green mark, um, stripes. Very, very beautiful. Um, so, and, and I see that, you know, she lays her eggs and there's little spiders that are born. It's all winter this happens. So, the, you know, the thing about that elaborate story is, again, our fear of what we don't want to understand. It's not even <laughs> what we don't understand. There's, oh, they, they, because there's a lack of curiosity, it's so easy to use the, the veil of fear and say, oh, I'm afraid of this. So I'm not going to bother getting to know it or trying to understand it. So, oh, that's because one spider in Australia has a deathly bite. So all spiders in Pakistan must be the same and all spiders in Europe, in Norway must be the same. And of course the entire Russian Federation has spiders that are all bad. So, <laughs> You know, the, the human is such a moron because we are fabulous with these blanket statements. So, you know, when I took these pictures, I, I do this every year and somebody inevitably will say, you're taking pictures of a spider. I was like, look at the dew on her web. Look mm -hmm. at the light coming through it. Look at the reflection. Look at the buoyancy. I mean, this is what architecture students should study in terms of structure, elasticity, torque, how that web moves. So my gardener will, will water everything like he does uh, ad nauseum, 
it doesn't damage the web. The water coming out of the hose, so it holds on to the water and lets it go. It's a fantastic piece of architecture. Aside from the process that you've described of her own body coming out and becoming this see-through, diaphanous, lace-like home, and then the whole thing gets IKEA style folded back and re ingested. <laughs> it's it's just so it's such a central and essential uh. process that we don't want to even look at because of fear. So the same fear that doesn't want to look at the heritage buildings because they don't understand it, the same fear that uh yesterday there was a again uh, a trophy hunt done, $50,000 spent on two guys killing one elephant. Oh. What is it? You know, it's just, I mean, that's not even fear, that's power. But, but f the fear is what one has to overcome. So, you're, you know, you talk about an ancient wisdom that is much further back than even, I was talking about five, six generations of ancestors and the grandparents, people who are very real. But, you're taking us further back into a wisdom of the embroideries being the same as the female spider embroidering her, her web as a temporary nomadic structure because once the babies are born and the season changes, she will move away. So she does this elaborate structure to lay the eggs to give birth to these creatures and then she will just fold up her bag and go somewhere else. So this gypsy, this gypsy uh, process, it, I mean, there's so much for us to learn. You know, the digital age is all about blurring boundaries, digital nomads, we talk about them, place, not place, the global village, Marshall McLuhan. So, and yet nobody wants to study the spider. <laughs> we're, back, we're back to this whole nonsense about fear, Gene. I mean, we keep coming, like, how do we, how do we get out of this vicious cycle of lack of curiosity because of fear? You, you know, we, we tussle with this often enough. They're afraid because there's a lack of curiosity. There's, because there's a lack of curiosity, it fuels the fear. Um, same, same issues again and again. Oh. Fear of the body, fear of the yes. skin, fear yes. of your body, fear of your skin, fear of your smell, fear you might touch somebody. I mean, having said that, I've just come off a flight where I was very happy that nobody was touching me. But that's, that's a different kind of touch. I mean, you know, I don't want to be touched while I'm filling out forms, which I also don't want to do. Um, you know, so while you think about something sensible to say to my now going to be very absurd statement, um, we fill out these forms. I remember arriving in uh, as a child in at, in London when I was in school, and also in the U.S. at Parsons. We would get this immigration form to fill out, and it would there's always a section that says um, sex, and then there's a box that says male and a box that says female. Nine out of 10 times, I've said yes. And, and nobody's read it. So you spend 10, 15 minutes before the plane lands writing out this nonsensical form. And when it says sex, male, female, I've always said yes, when they should have said gender or, you know, of course now they have binary and non-binary and all of that. But back in those days when things were much more barbaric and uh, wild, <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say yes to sex. Nobody said, young man, that's not the answer to the question. You have to tell us what your gender is. I would just say, yes, yeah, sex, yes, please. I, yeah. I said yes in so many of those. And I think I was even traveling with my mother once and she said, what nonsense is this? You're filling it. I said, I'm not filling out the wrong <laughs> answer. That is the correct answer. They want to know if I want to have sex. Yes, I want to have sex. <laughs> so, but you know, this, what I, is the fear? What, what I, is the, I, what is the fear of a, of freedom? Such a, um, important question right now and my experience is that 
everybody knows what they're afraid of deep 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 inside of them and depending on their culture depending on if they have a religion depending on you know so many things they fear is a constant in everybody's life what's driving i think the incredibly fast distracted pace of life today is that fear so that fear was there as far as i'm concerned long before the climate emergency the pandemic the those two very very destructive visibly destructive distortions of our relation to the natural world have roots so far back and the fear that you're talking about because nobody talks about fear you know nobody really helps the child who is afraid when they feel themselves being closed in by well let's say don't touch the hot stove well my grandson of course stuck touched it and i have scars on my wrists when i first went camping at a really early age we used these tin cans with the bottom uh part of the can off and we would put them over the fire and then we'd put an egg on top so of course i wanted to see if my can was hot before i put the egg on so burns on my arm so i mean it's i'm not you know saying everybody should go and do the opposite of what your parents say but there has to be a way to first for children not just to be told because of course what could be more of a curiosity stimulus when you're that age when your whole life force is to experience and you're being told no 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 you have to sit this way at the table you have to not talk when you're at the you know dining table all the rules every culture it's different so fear is a common i as far as my uh experience common but nobody talks about it so then you're isolated you think oh you know as you look around you when you're on the subway everybody's blank faced and you can't say you know i'm i'm really afraid today such and such like today with the dire reports of the tropical storm coming i'm remembering other storms but that doesn't mean the new one will be that way and so that to me is the difference whatever i'm not just talking about education and parents and the responsibility that those labels give us to help a child or someone who comes to you in fear the important thing is courage courage and that's so available but when you step into yourself it's not available if you're distracted and you're afraid and this person like i have a friend in new mexico and he was talking about what he had to go through in santa fe to get into a restaurant a couple of days ago i mean he couldn't believe it his temperature was taken i don't know all these things he had to go through before he could even have a meal i mean that's going to make you really nervous about the waiter the waitress the people sitting near you who knows the you know it's the way we avoid really saying what is going on today what is going on we're a social creature and as de blasio the mayor of new york city has learned unless he's patrolling the streets people want to be outside and if it's a bar that's open or a restaurant they're all going to flock there at the beaches 
you know, play concerts. The human impulse after being locked up is just, you know, to feel like freedom means you do anything you want. And courage is to really look to see what needs to be done, as far as I'm concerned. So you have to look at the fear. If you don't look at the fear, how are you going to know what to do? Oh, there you are. So I think, I think the, you know, the post-quarantine release of um, the human adult, in a sense, has brought out the child in all of them. Uh. Right? Because, because they were put into a pen and not yep. by their own choice and yep. by the threat and fear of losing life. So when they've come out, they're doing silly things. And it's quite endearing to see their stupidities and the silly things that they're doing, very childlike. I think for us, and when I say us, I mean all of us here on the last 40 live chats, and anybody who believes that the work that you and I have done separately and are doing together has some merit, this is an opportunity for all of us to actually bring this um, distracted energy uh, through a funnel into a space where we can all help them address their fears and get them to get involved in things where they realize that how dependent they are on their hands and how the hand and brain is related to one another and the beauty of all the space between the head and the hand, which is covered by skin. This would be a great opportunity to bring these people in and, and reconfigure their energy to their own benefit through an educational program that is built to develop confidence and built to develop courage and built to develop their own self-esteem, to even address um, emotional baggage or potential mental health issues that they don't want to talk about, that they don't they feel there's a stigma to go to um, a therapist for. I mean, you know, there's some people who are on that borderline where they're not ready yet, but they do need the help. And you know, as teachers, we, we start sensing these issues. So this would, I think this would be a great time to bring these different diverse and divergent peoples together um, into the fold of some place where they are using their bodies and let them, let them create fabric, let them understand how that hand loom works. And you know, you're pushing something back and forth and you're doing the warp and the weft and then you're pulling something down. It's like playing the harmonium. So get them to play music, build their own musical instruments. It doesn't have to be complicated. We don't want them to create grand pianos, but simpler <laughs> things, one string instruments. And, and, Weave some of their own fabric. Put it on. Go to the go to the uh, go go to the yak. Go to the buffalo. Pull out from the shrubs that the animal has walked through any of their fur that they've left behind, and start weaving it together, making their own thread. I think once an appreciation for the time it takes to create these things that are right now just commodities they can throw away and they don't have value for. I think we really create a new generation of young adults, adults will child like playful, um, positive values. So then, you know, then, then we can come down to the children. But I think the adults right now really need this opportunity to play in a constructive manner, you know, globally. That, that for me, I think is something that you and I should really do. And anybody else who's been watching us, if you like this idea, please come forward. I do get messages. I would love some more messages. <laughs> Share your ideas. Tell us what you think. Hadia, you've joined us. You're a teacher. You teach kids all the time. Uh, you know, you have family. Onessa teaches. I know there's other people here who have siblings that they teach at home, young children. And, and I've had so many adults go on these trips with me. So I think this is something we should build on. Jean, any final statements? We're almost out of time again. Well, I just want to make, make sure that everybody realizes that Jen and I want to do this because we want to do it too. We want to play with yes. anybody yes. who's ready and just will play. We don't know what's going to come out of it. It's so important. This moment in time is a gift. If, you know, I, I ob absolutely, people who have died, people who have, are suffering, that it won't be in vain. If we can yep. start together. Come, come play with us. Come play with yep. us. And on that note, before we are rudely cut off, because I hate that, 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Jean. Love Thank everyone you. out there. Take care. Thank Have you. a great day. Keep a helmet on.